Welcome back everybody. Today's video is a continuation of our general trauma management videos, so our bleeding control, uh, tension pneumothorax, that kind of thing. And today we're gonna be discussing uh, chest trauma, how to recognize it and how to treat it. All right, before we get into the meat of the video, a quick channel update for you guys. I've got a lot of great stuff coming up down the road. I'm actually fortunate enough to have a company reach out to me and offer to send me a couple IFACs uh, to be reviewed on the channel, and then also a couple extra to be given away to you guys. So in the next couple weeks, we'll be doing a giveaway. Stay tuned for that. I'll be announcing it a little bit earlier on my Instagram, but it will also come up on YouTube and I'll tell you how to enter and all of that good stuff. Um, next week, I'm going to be going to a SWAT school, so I'm going to try to get a video while I'm there. Uh, I don't know what the topic will be yet, but I do have to be kind of tactful because I'm there mainly to learn for myself, and a lot of the guys at these classes don't really enjoy being filmed a whole lot, so uh, it kind of remains to be seen if I'll be able to produce a video or not. I need to be respectful of their wishes. So we'll see if I don't come out with a video next week. That's why, but I will make a solid effort to get something to you guys. So jumping into the video, today's video, like I said before, is all about thoracic trauma. So chest trauma, uh, how to recognize and treat it. We're going to be talking about three main types of chest trauma. The first is blunt trauma, penetrating trauma, and then in kind of a subcategory of penetrating trauma, we'll talk about how to deal with impaled objects. So the first category we're going to discuss is your blunt force trauma. This is you know, falling out of a car, getting hit. Uh, something like that where there's a force exerted on your chest, but uh, you don't have anything that's actually penetrating the chest wall. This can result in any number of internal injuries that we need to be aware of in the pre-hospital setting. Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot we can do uh, for these patients outside of an operating room. One of the first lessons any EMT or paramedic student learns is that trauma is not fixed in the field, it's fixed in the hospital. So keep that in mind as we go forward. If you have somebody that's experienced blunt force trauma, you're going to assess them in a couple ways. First, you're going to take your hand and you're going to blade it right on the sternum to make sure that's stable. And then you can come around on their chest wall and palpate around their chest, come to the side and have them take a deep breath. What you're looking for in these cases is uh, broken ribs, so crepitus. If you do that and you feel something shift or you feel something when they breathe in that's not equal, that's a big indication of blunt force trauma. Um, also, you're going to be looking for signs of a pneumothorax, so you want to listen to both sides of the uh, lungs, make sure that they're equal. Um, you're going to be looking for hyperresonance or uh, motion that's not equal on either side of the chest. They take a breath, one side goes up, the other one does not. Additionally, pain of the patient is a good indicator that there's underlying trauma. So there are a couple main injuries that can occur from this, and we'll talk about the management of each. Uh, the first one, and the one that we're probably most uh, concerned about, is going to be a tension pneumothorax. And I discussed that in another video. The in-depth treatment of that is there if you want to take a look at it. Uh, but a tension pneumothorax is a collapsed lung, um, and that can be caused in blunt force trauma if you have what's called barotrauma, so huge increase in pressure on the inside of the lung from that force. Um, or it can be caused by a rib fracture that's displaced inwards that actually punctures the lung and causes that uh, to collapse. The other thing we're looking for are uh, major rib fractures. So if you have three or more ribs uh, in a row that are fractured in two spots each, you can get what's called a flail segment. And this is a section of ribs that won't actually go in and out when the patient takes a deep breath. And this is a big problem. So management, tension pneumothorax, obviously we're going to do a needle decompression on the affected side and relieve that pressure. Now, if it's broken ribs, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot we can do for them. Uh, back in the emergency uh, days, if you ever watched that show, they would take a cinder block, put it on the chest uh, to keep that segment in place. Even when I went to school about seven years ago, we would take a big bulky dressing, tie it really tight in to try to get that flail segment to hold still. Now we're not doing any of that. Basically, you're going to be doing supportive measures. Keep them in the position of comfort. Uh, give them supplemental oxygen if they're saturating kind of low, 
and you might have to do uh, rescue breathing for them if they're not able to take those deep breaths. Be aware if you're going to do rescue breathing that that actually increases the chances of attention pneumothorax. So I'm not saying not to do it, but just be aware that's a potential complication and make sure you're monitoring the patient constantly for the formation of attention pneumothorax. So for this type of injury, you, your goal should be to get them to a hospital as soon as possible, and that's going to maximize their chances of survival. The second type of trauma that we're going to discuss is penetrating trauma. So penetrating trauma is your stab wound or your gunshot wound or even just a random object that impaled the patient. So this kind of trauma can cause what's called a sucking chest wound. And I'm not going to go too in depth in the physics of respiration, but essentially when you take a deep breath in, your diaphragm is actually contracting down and that's causing negative pressure in your chest and causing your lungs to fill with air. Now if you do that, and you've got a hole that's equal size or larger than your trachea, instead of it coming through the air coming through your mouth, it's actually going to be sucked into the hole in the chest, and that's going to cause the lung to collapse. Obviously, you don't have any alveoli on the outside of your lung, which is what actually transfers the gases, so they're going to be breathing into their uh, thoracic cavity, and there's not going to be any oxygenation happening. Luckily for us, this is pretty easy to treat. Now, I'm going to preface this next part by saying I usually do these medical videos inside the hospital where I have access to mannequins and a lot of training supplies. I don't have any of those at home. So in today's video, we're going to be pretending that this box is someone's chest, and we're going to be demonstrating on this. So let's say you have penetrating trauma. Now, this is a sucking chest wound, and we need to treat this. It's going to be bleeding a little bit, but my biggest concern with this is that I don't want air to get into this. Or I can't just put a gauze pad over that because those are um, permeable, so it will actually suck air through the dressing. So in this case, we have to get what's called an occlusive dressing. This is a trainer hyphen chest seal from North American Rescue. It doesn't matter what brand you get. Um, you know, this is what we use, so this is what I have. And what these are is these are plastic dressings that have some vents in them that can go over these wounds and create kind of an artificial skin to keep any air from coming into that. The vent also allows air out to expel whatever air was in that cavity when you put it on and keep anything from coming back. So to apply this, it's pretty simple. You want to peel it off the protective cover. You're going to take it and you're just going to stick it right over the wound. Um, you want the wound kind of centered right here so that the valve can actually be used. Uh, but there's really nothing to it. So this is going to be your general management. Now, you're not really going to be too concerned about controlling bleeding because any bleeding is going to be way internal, and there's really no way to stop that uh, in the pre-hospital setting, which brings us back to getting the patients to uh, the emergency room and essentially the operating room as soon as possible. Be aware with any kind of penetrating trauma that there may be an exit wound. So if you have somebody that shot you can treat the stuff on the front, but make sure you're doing a good blood sweep and a visual inspection of the back uh, to ensure there's not a through and through. If there's a through and through, treat it the same way. Just take a second chest seal, put it on the back. That's one of the reasons I like the hyphens is you can get them in a twin pack, so you always have two on you um, to do both an entrance and an exit wound. Be aware that once you put this on, the patient's at an increased risk of developing a tension pneumothorax, so monitor them constantly. If that occurs, all you have to do is take the edge of this and burp that wound, and that will release whatever air is trapped. Now, in some cases that might not work, or in other cases you might not want to take this off because there's a lot of blood and gore and the adhesives won't stick back onto the patient. In those cases, just take your uh, needle decompression and do a decompression on that patient if you're trained to do so. If not, try burping it and go from there. The last and final piece of trauma that we're going to talk about is your impaled objects. So going back to our little simulated chest, if you have somebody that, say, was stabbed and they have an impaled object in their chest, we do not want to remove this. So when somebody's stabbed, this is severing a lot of arteries and veins, and this is actually acting as a pressure dressing at the same time. Because it just severed those arteries, it's going to be up against that, and it might be occluding some bleeding. So if you pull this out, they can bleed to death and die. Steve Irwin probably still would be alive today if they had left the stingray barb in his heart 
because as soon as they pulled that up, it opened the floodgates and he bled out internally. So never ever removed an, remove an impaled object. Uh, there are some ex exceptions, but we'll talk about that right at the end here. So how do we treat this? Well, we do not want this knife sitting here doing this, making uh, mincemeat of the internal organs. So we wanna stabilize this as best we can. And this is one of those situations where your critical thinking skills are gonna come into play because it doesn't really matter how you stabilize this. All it matters is that this is stabilized and kept from moving anywhere. Probably the most common way to do it is you take some bulky dressings and you can put them on either side of the object and then tape around it. And that's gonna hold it still, keep it from moving around, keep it from coming out or going any deeper in. Then you can take tape or other cravats and wrap around the patient and secure that in place. Obviously, other supportive measures like oxygen therapy and bag valve mask respirations are gonna come into play here, uh, but this is how you stabilize the object itself. Now, there are two main reasons why you would have to remove an impaled object. Uh, the first reason is if that impaled object is going to interfere with CPR. So if the patient's dead and you're gonna attempt resuscitation on them and say, I think the EMS like example they give is always an ax buried in the sternum. So if you have that, they're in cardiac arrest, you can remove that ax to do CPR uh, because although that might cause more harm, uh, you're not, they're already dead so you're not gonna do any more damage um, and you might give them a chance at life. The second reason you might remove an object is if it is actively causing an airway obstruction. Airway, breathing, circulation are our three biggest concerns. And if they don't have an airway, it doesn't matter how good your care is, they're going to die. So you if, say, they've got a knife that's in the trachea that's blocking that airway, you can pull that out. And that's not to say that that's not going to cause uh, issues down the road, but it's what you have to do in that situation. So a quick recap here for you guys. If the patient has a blunt force trauma, it's gonna be supportive measures only. So give them oxygen, breathe for them if you have to, and manage pain as best you can. If it is a penetrating trauma, so gunshot wound, knife wound, something like that, we're gonna take an occlusive dressing and put it over the wound. Make sure you're looking for both an entrance and an exit wound on these patients. And then the third type of trauma is going to be your impaled object. If they have an impaled object, do not remove that object stabilize it in place, and get to the hospital as soon as possible. You can remove those objects if CPR has to be performed and it's interfering, or if it's an active airway obstruction. If you have any questions about this video or anything I talked about today, please leave them in the comments down below. I really enjoy hearing from you guys. Um, I'm really excited that this channel has grown so much over the past several months. My goal starting this about six months ago was to get to 1,000 subscribers by the end of the year, and we're at almost 20,000. So my expectations have absolutely been blown out of the water, and I'm very thankful to all of you. Like always, thanks for watching, and I will see you next week.